Terrific. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Ella, for the introduction. Looking forward to today, as Ella said, this is, this is going to be a lot of fun because it is the opportunity today to actually measure uh, where our brands are on the brand um, optimality scorecard and, and using the algorithm. So I'm excited about that because uh, it's, it's, it hopefully will be a very revealing uh, period for everyone. So let's jump in. I'll start off with uh, the lasso framework and methodology that has been the core element of these conversations over the last several months. Uh, this is the basis for the way we've been looking at brands. And um, as, I, you know, as I shared earlier, um, the la use of the lasso model is helpful in several ways. The first one is if you're a brand expert, the Lasso model helps you prioritize your IP. Which of those brands have the greatest potential to expand? And then where to focus your resources based on that potential? If you're a brand owner, but you're not an expert, then this algorithm, which we're gonna go through today, helps you determine how expandable your brand is and what that may mean for your business. And in many instances, your brand may not be ready to expand, but that's okay. We're learning from this and we can learn how to grow our brands such that we can build our equity and be ready to expand in the future. And then finally, for those that are not capable of scoring the brands, this is really new information. It's, it's something that you're kind of dipping your toe into because you're an expert in another category. The framework still can be relevant and useful tool in running your business because we ask the questions that are thoughtful that will help you consider what you should be doing and, and not be doing. So congratulations. You're now ready to score your brand against the five lasso categories. And from these scores, we'll be able to estimate whether or not your brand is optimized. And then as, as we were sharing, armed with this knowledge, you can begin to see what possibilities might exist to extend or expand your brand. And for us, um, we're really grateful because over time, the lasso model will become more and more robust. And when that happens, when the data set gets bigger, we'll go from only under-optimized and optimized to under-optimized, slightly under-optimized, optimized, slightly over-optimized, and over-optimized. And that's gonna be great information for you and, and helpful for us. So before we start this, I wanted to give a quote, uh, share a quote from a gentleman named Jeff Lottman. He is the CEO of Global Icons. It's one of the largest licensing agencies in the world. And he was one of the individuals that I interviewed for the book. And he actually just wrote a book um, himself that came out. I think I want to remember the name of the book was uh, something around uh, stretchable brands because he and I think very much alike. And this is what Jeff said. The money derived from royalties generated should not matter. Today, there is no way to truly measure the full value a brand licensing program brings. There's no measurement on licensing. In licensing, one day you can have no retail presence and the next day you have four feet of shelf space. What is that worth? Or when someone wears your t-shirt that never previously existed, the value is enormous. People don't look at money on PR money on PR or advertising. In other words, they don't look at how much it costs, but for some reason, people get fixated on it when it comes to licensing. And I'll just share just before this started, uh, Walter was kind enough to share that he has an Atlanta, Georgia t-shirt, which is great. Um, and he bought that t-shirt well before he met me and well before, um, you know, he knew that I was from Atlanta, but nevertheless, for whatever reason, he saw the t-shirt it looked compelling. It was made of high quality material and he bought it. So now Atlanta has got a presence in, in the UK and potentially out throughout Europe. So they have their own licensing program. And what is that worth? Can we measure the full value of brand licensing? Well, the lasso model is what I'm saying is the first attempt to begin to agree on how to measure that full value. And the algorithm takes into consideration each of the elements of the lasso scoring framework. The, the reason for that is we're wanting to allow users to self-evaluate their brand and receive recommendations on how optimally the brand is expanded. And what it's going to do is simulate an expert assessment of the brand expansion in an automated manner 
allowing consistent and objective brand evaluation. In other words, you're measuring based on what you know as if, if someone like me was measuring on your behalf. So the algorithm gives you the insights of an expert in brand expansion, which is a, a neat thing to have. Now there's a lot of different, um, uh, I would ca call them elements or a platform of the, of the creation of the Lasso model. I'm only gonna share three. The first one is that the Lasso model uses a gold standard data set of brand evaluations generated by an expert panel, including myself and two other specialists. And that data set was used to optimize, train, and evaluate the model. The resulting algorithm produced by this analysis performs both accurately and repeatedly, which is really important in an algorithm, which provides a, a robust solution with which users may evaluate their own brands. And third, the data set generated by the expert panel consists of both the lasso scores and a corresponding determination of brand expansion for 56 brands. And those 56 brands allowed us to be able to build the lasso model. Uh, there's a lot more, as I said, one of the things I'll share is that we used machine learning in the algorithm, which we felt was a much better way. And then we use multiple models actually. And then what the model, the bigger model does is it takes a look at the multiple models and it chooses the best selection for each individual. Now, knowing that, garbage in, garbage out. The results of any rubric, process, or program are contingent on the quality of the data that goes into the evaluator. So keeping this in mind, you got to input, input the most accurate scores possible because your results are dependent on it. If you don't have a good score going in, if you don't thoughtfully measure your brand against each of these categories, then whatever you put in is going to come, come out scrambled and the results you're gonna get are not reflective of your brand. So it's really important to understand each one of these and then to thoughtfully score your brand. So time for a review and I'll tell you this, today I'm going to measure uh, alongside with you two brands, the Coca-Cola brand, which is a brand that I, uh, I've worked with for almost 20 years. I worked at the Coca-Cola company for 10 years and they've been my client on and off for the last 10 years. And then I'm also gonna measure uh, my brand, our brand, Brand Alive, uh, which has been around um, for only a couple years, but the company has been around for more than 10. So let's refresh ourselves on the key takeaways from each lasso category described in the earlier chapters or the earlier webinars. And this will give you an opportunity to select the best score. So let's start with lateral. Let's be clear on the following. What is your brand most linked to? A specific product set or a general idea? What qualifies your brand to take ownership of one or the other? What problem are consumers trying to solve? Or let's just say people trying to solve that your brand takes care of. Why would consumers or users or businesses choose your brand to solve that problem? And are you big enough and well known enough to take on their problem? And do you have staying power? Continuing, will the extension be a no brainer? Or are you asking consumers or businesses to stretch their minds beyond reason? What is the downside of this pursuit? And there could be many of them, right? Distraction, use of resources, failure, does the expansion bring any negative aspects that could hurt your brand's equity or core business? In other words, if you're expanding into a category that actually has a negative connotation, like when I mentioned earlier about Coca-Cola potentially putting their brand on lighters, the negative aspect of that was so great, I shied away from it with a lot of, um, with a visceral reaction, let's say. Does the core business bring any negative aspects that could hurt your brand's extension or expansion? When I had a client before that was in the software business, one of the things about their brand was it was known to slow down computers. So we had to be very careful about the extensions that we were looking at because we knew that negative connotation could follow through to the extension or expansion. And if there is a negative aspect and you choose to proceed, how will you counter each of those particular negative, negative aspects? What are the lateral key takeaways? 
First, a brand will fail to expand if there's lack of demand, uninspiring un supply, a lack of relevance, or just pure execution. So you could have everything right, but you just perform poorly, it's not gonna be successful. Brand growth is about growing what you already have. This is really helpful. Brand growth is expanding or, or reinforcing or building on what you already have, whereas brand extension is focusing on building out the product portfolio. The way I like to think about that is Coke, Diet Coke, caffeine-free Coke, cherry Coke. Those are all extensions of the core product, which is Coca-Cola. Brand expansions is taking the brand into new and un unrelated categories. Think about Harley Davidson restaurants or Harley Davidson apparel. That's, that's different categories away from the core category, which is motorcycles. Every brand needs an expansion point, which I say is a pivotal characteristic that gives a brand an emotion, emotional basis for growth. It's that point where, from which you say, okay, this category reinforces that emotion. When we talk about Coca-Cola, it's really around happiness and happy memories. So what categories reinforce that? And the ones that do not, those are the ones you have to shy away from. And what are the categories for your brand? Continuing. Where consumers associate a brand closely with a product, the brand is more likely to be successful looking to extend its product lines within that segment. And I've given the example before with M&M's candy, right? They started out with just chocolate, candy co covered chocolate. And then they put peanuts inside. And then they put pretzels inside. And then they put almonds inside. And then they put caramel inside. And truth be told, they could put pretty much anything inside of that chocolate coating and have permission because their brand is closely associated with that product. Now, where a brand is more closely linked with an emotion, it may be easier to expand the brand beyond its initial category. I didn't say it would be, but it might be. And if you think of those brands like Harley Davidson, Caterpillar, Coca-Cola, Virgin, they all connect emotionally. So the question is for you, is your brand connecting with a product or is your brand connecting with an emotion? That's really important to know. And sometimes what happens is we can kind of believe our own hype and we start believing that we're more connected with an emotion than a product. And we start getting into categories that have no, we have no business getting into because we're disconnected. Brands should expand into sectors where they will have a specific advantage because of how consumers perceive them. Whenever I talk to a client, I always say, What's the advantage, what's the competitive advantage your brand brings to this category? Because if there isn't one, there's no reason to go there. Consumers are not going to buy your product, even if you think it might be exciting. Finally, expand into sectors that have healthy growth potential. Otherwise, you're going into a stall category and no matter how good your brand is, it's not going to be beneficial to you or to the consumers. So I want to step back for a second and talk about a case study on paper made. And this is an opportunity for us to start to reflect on the lateral brand and, and think about how we're going to score our particular brand against this particular element. So in the case of, of paper made, paper made is a global brand and they had an opportunity where they wanted to extend into the middle Eastern region, but because of some of the rules and regulations in the middle East, they were precluded to, from doing that through vertical integration. In other words, they couldn't bring their uh, plant there, they couldn't bring their assembly business there, they couldn't bring their marketing and sales there. They had to incorporate local businesses. And so because of that, they decided that they were going to think about how they could use licensing as a way to help them get into the Middle Eastern market. And so they looked at an opportunity where they could um, engage a company that would do the assembling in the local region, which complied with the laws, and then they licensed the paper made brand to them. And so this met with the rules and regulations of the local um, governments and enabled paper made to have a presence in the marketplace. And the success was really terrific because the brand was loved in the region they overcame the uh, governmental restrictions through the assembly, uh, which was done by a company, the licensing of the brand, 
and in, and in totality, the results were they ma maintained and grew a, a presence in that region. So that's an example of a brand licensing biz, uh, opportunity combined with uh, some more collaboration in order to get a brand to a marketplace where consumers were looking for the brand. All right, we're now at that point where we need to think about our lateral score chart and how we're gonna score our brands. So let me review these. Number one, we will only ever stay in the one category that, which we're in. Score number two, we, we could extend our brand to, to include new or evolving opportunities, but still within our core category. Number three, we could extend our brand into a number of related categories. Number four, our brand has enough latitude to expand into a new and unrelated category with strong growth characteristics. We have the opportunity, fit, and leverage to do that successfully. Number five, our customers align with our brand on emotive much more than product lines. As long as we stay consistent with that emotion, we can take the brand into a range of different and unrelated sectors. Now, as I told you, I'm gonna score Coca-Cola and Brand Alive. And what I want you to do right now is think about your own brand and put a little score down next to an L for your brand's score. So with Coca-Cola, you know, I looked at each of these and I said, ah, check, check on number one, check on number two, check on number three, check on number four. In fact, Coca-Cola can say their customers align with their brand on an emotive basis. And as long as they stay consistent with that emotion, which we talked about before, which is around happiness and, and happy memories versus you know, whatever association might be uh, aligned with something like a lighter, uh, then they can take the brand into a range of different and unrelated sectors, and they have done that. So they get a score of five. Now, Brand Alive, <laughs> we're, we're not anywhere close to Coca-Cola. I say we have a score of two. We could extend our brand in, to include new or evolving opportunities, but still within our core category. Our core category is branding, brand strategy, brand expansion, brand extension, and licensing. And so we are actually looking and we have looked and we have done some of this. So this is, this is where we score our brand. Holistically, that's where we're at. Hopefully you've had the opportunity to now reflect on your own brand and you've given yourself a score. Go ahead, Ella. Yeah, so we'd love to hear from you guys what that score is. Um, where you think your brand is um, to get an idea of where we are and then uh, maybe to talk through that and see um, sort of which category you're in. I see a one, I see a two, I see a three. That's great. We'll give it a couple more seconds. I know uh, Tim is driving, so he may not be, if he's actually driving, he may not be scoring his brand right now on this on this pull chart. So, so just to set context on mine, I sent something in the in the in the chat. All of mine are aspirational. Uh, right now, my score is a zero because we're just getting started. So, but okay, but I I, I aspire to a three if if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's perfect sense. And and truth be told there is no need nor um, expectation for any of us to think that we have to get to a five. Whatever score makes the most sense for us against all of these is exactly where we should be. And then when you combine those and you put them into the algorithm, it tells you whether or not your brand potentially is uh, under expanded or optimally expanded. But even if it's under expanded, you may still want to keep it right where it's at. So, um, so it's just a guide and, 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 and the other thing I would say is the algorithm is just a reinforcement, hopefully, of what you already know about your brand. All right, let's stop sharing that and we'll keep going. And Pete, sorry, you're, you're right. I'm gonna have to do the exercises when I'm not driving, sorry. Okay, no worries. All right, so we wanna, we wanna I'm gonna go ahead and close this, Ella, and we'll, we'll, we'll move forward. So now let's talk about addictive. When we think about the addictive quality of a brand, the questions that we, we want to ask ourselves and answer is first, how does expansion play into the overall journey on which you're taking consumers? 
And we remember when, when I say consumers, I'm, I'm talking B2C, but if you're B2B, then you have to think about your clients or your or businesses. Or in, in some cases, you have a buyer and you have an end user. So think about that also, right? All of those are important constituents that you need to consider. What part of the journey are you involved in and what parts should be outsourced? Right? So when we talked about the example just a little while ago about PaperMate, because of the governmental circumstances, they were involved in building the brand and building some of the elements of the brand, but the assembly took place in the marketplace and the selling, the marketing and selling took place there also. What do your current consumers yearn for that your brand can deliver on? Escapism, distraction, adventure, or authority. And each of us should have that own, our own particular descriptor of what we're trying to accomplish. If you expand into specific categories, will consumers see the connections between the various expressions of your brand? We talk about this um, when I talk about personal branding or, and just in general about branding. We need to be um, ruthlessly consistent with our brand expression. And we also have to also run your, we also have to realize that everything communicates. So if we don't know exactly what we want to communicate, then we're likely communicating something we don't want to communicate, if that makes sense. How will you engage them and direct them from one activity to another if you're doing more than one expression? Continuing, is your involvement with the brand tied to a specific time frame or project? Or are you targeting a longer horizon? And both answers can be right. And maybe there's both, both um, you can have both at the same time, something short-term and something long-term. And I do that often. Are you offering your consumers the optimal mix of frequency, how often they see you, intensity, what level they see you, access, their ability to engage your brand, and surprise, right? We talk about surprisingly consistent and consistently surprising, right? Surprise is important. You don't want to lull your, uh, your consumer or your client or your enthusiast into a sleep. That's not a good thing. And surprise will help them stay engaged. And if they are, is it on their terms or your terms? Because we always need to be thinking about putting things on the terms of our constituents, our consumers, our fans, our enthusiasts, our buyers, our, our clients. How dependent are you on ancillary revenue to meet your growth targets? So if you're not dependent, you can really think about the brand expansion as a way to engage your consumer in a more holistic fashion, which will then build your relationship with them. If you are dependent on it, you may be susceptible to doing some things that are not good for your brand long term. Can you look to your licensees to build brand loyalty and love in addition to royalty revenue? Going back to the quote of Jeff Lottman, right? When you engage licensees, these are companies that love your brand, hopefully as much as you do or darn near close to it, then they express your brand in the marketplace in different categories. And if they do that well, then you're getting greater and greater exposure in the marketplace by partners that are as good at their category as you are your category, which is just an overall great thing for everyone. Continuing, addictive brands play to people's appetite for more, right? When something's addictive, we want to keep going back to it. That's a bad addiction. Let's think about like cigarettes, or it could be a good addiction, right? It's your favorite um, Netflix uh, show that you watch and you keep going back because it is so enjoyable. Consumers are driven by the thrill of pursuit and the wish to be current, of course, fear of missing out. Addictive brands are consumer facing. Even if your brand's B2B, it may have a consumer facing element to it. Think about like Caterpillar, what they did with their program, right? $50 billion global business who engages in B2C, you know, with um, example, mobile phone protectors and, and apparel, and, and gloves and all kinds of things, right? That talk about their durability and toughness. And so consumers buy about $3 billion worth of Caterpillar merchandise on an annual basis. Don't confuse the subject matter with the appeal. Star Wars took place in space, 
but it's addictive. That's the quality that extended far beyond the sci-fi genre. So the appeal is what's most important. Extending or expanding your brand requires taking holistic approach to realize a brand's full potential. What more do people want exactly from your brand? It's really important for us to think about that. And that's where research comes in. And that's what we do all the time is we're asking, we're constantly asking folks like you, is this what you're looking for? Is this helpful? What else are you looking for? How can we help solve your problems? Invest in categories that fit with the brand, but that also align with how and where consumers want to buy. Always keeping that consumer or that client mindset. Characters can make a brand addictive. I'm actually working with my brother on a project, uh, which is really exciting and it's too early to talk much about it, but we're actually considering a character as part of the brand because we know it's going to add an element of fun and it's going to bring to bear something that's important about his cause. Now, knowing that, what adds value and stickiness is authentic storytelling and or play value. So one of the things that I've got him doing is writing down his story, how he came to invent this product and why he did it. And how the, you know, how does that character help tell the story will be something important for us to consider. Uh, in the US, there's a big insurance company called Geico. They created a, um, a character, character called the Gecko uh, as a way to communicate their, their brand story. And they, they do it in a fun and effective way. Consumers will hook into properties and ideas that take even the most skilled veterans by surprise. And that's the power of serendipity. When we think about like Pokemon Go, right? The parties that got involved in that, Neantic Labs and, um, and, and the, the parent company of Pokemon, they had no idea that it would be as successful as it was. They knew it would be successful, but their, their concept of how successful was um, blown away. And that's what can happen when you pull together great partnerships like that. Everything today is about ecosystems. Increasingly, addictiveness is part of the financial model, not just the consumer relationship model. And going back to what Jeff Lottman said is, you know, when somebody wears a t-shirt of yours that never existed before, what is the value of that? That value is immeasurable, right? Your royalties from that might be $1 or one euro, but the value of somebody wearing that t-shirt could be hundreds of times, if not thousands of times more valuable than that. So I want to talk about a case study about the NFL. Uh, this was a really great um, interview I had with a woman who was running their international business. And she was really focused on the playing of the NFL game in London. And at that time, it was, there was one game being played. It was played at Wembley Stadium. And at the time, the uh, ability to sell merchandise around the event was limited. So if you think about the NFL, what are they selling? They're selling an experience, right? They're selling 22 men on the field of play, battling against each other. And even if you're not a fan of a particular team or a particular player, the NFL has made it such that the experience of the game and all of the, uh, let's just say the physical toughness of it and the exhilaration of it makes it really engaging. And so they realize that by creating merchandise for all of the teams gives the opportunity for the consumer who, in, who links into a, uh, a particular team or a particular player, the opportunity to memorialize that experience. The problem was in, um, at Wembley Stadium, there, like I said, there wasn't a lot of opportunity to sell. And so what they did was they erected a 50 foot long white building. Uh, they, the, in the words of the woman that I was interviewing, she called it a, a depredation chamber. Like it was void of any, um, anything other than the merchandise and then this frame, this white building. And so they had five hours, basically, the consumers had five hours to, to buy before, during, and after the game. And so everybody was coming into this building, rushing into it, grabbing whatever they could. And then there was 40 queues at the end with 40 tills. So who knew which line to join, right? Somebody gets in one line that has three people, but the person in front of them has a hundred things. They may miss half the game. And so they knew that there was a mess here and they knew that they had to fix it. And they knew that they had to create 
and experience buying the merchandise that was just as enjoyable as the game itself. And so they went and looked at what Disney did and they looked at the Everest um, exhibition, which if, if you haven't been to Disney World, um, Mount Everest is a roller coaster ride that is really fun. But what makes it enjoyable is the experience of the wait. When you go in line, you go through this um, uh, make-believe world of expedi expeditionaries climbing Mount Everest, how to prepare for the, for the journey, what uh, equipment to bring. And so they brought all that to life. And so NFL went to school, learned what Disney did, and brought that back to their experience. And so they changed it from this white um, you know, chamber void of anything to adding music, to adding imagery, basically um, making the experience of the game come alive in this particular um, uh, retail out, uh, experience or retail uh, store. And so what happened, and, and the, the other thing was they said, look, we would love to sell merchandise during the, during the whole season, but we can have it negatively impact our sales at the game. And so they brought in a partner to sell online, knowing that there was going to be concern by senior management if their sales during the game dropped. Well, the truth be told, the online sales actually increased um, the experience overall and, and built the, the, the universe more such that the experience was tremendously better, the sales went up during the game, and there was an incremental sales online. So overall, the effect was going from something that was really seen as a horrible experience, uh, taking away from the game itself to something that was extremely complimentary, and people actually enjoying hanging out in the retail event space um, during the game. So now we're at addictive score at the addictive score chart. So let me take you through the, the uh, descriptors and then we can select which score for our brand. So number one, there are only limited opportunities to interact with our brand. We tend to work on a quote unquote, as required basis. Number two, we need to find new ways to involve our customers more within our core category. We need to give them more reasons to come back to us. Number three, we could be more inventive in how we involve people with our brand. We need to forge stronger links between what we continue to give them and what we ask them to continue to pay for. Number four, our brand is compelling enough to expand into whole new areas and to take our audiences with us. We'll change our revenue model by continuing to surprise and delight via what they can access. And number five, our core business is just the starting point for a highly inclusive, engaging journey with our customers that spans all sorts of touch points. That journey is where we generate the real money. Now, going back to my two um, scores, uh, look at Coca-Cola, one for sure, two for sure, three for sure, four for sure, and truth be told, five for sure. And so they get another score of five. For Brand Alive, I think we're at number three. We could be more inventive in how we involve people with our brand. We need to forge stronger links between what we continue to give them and what we ask them to continue to pay for. But we've, we've, we've checked the boxes on one and two. And now it's your turn. And I think we have another poll, right, Ella? Yes, we do. I'm pulling it up right now. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm seeing a two, I'm seeing a three, and I'm seeing a four. That's great. Excellent. Well, good for you guys. So everybody's outside of the, the one category, and some are actually in the four level, which is fabulous. So from an addictive, addictive aspect, we're doing well. Congratulations. All right, make a note of that. We'll go ahead and close this out and we'll, um, we'll keep going. So let's talk about story. Be clear on the following to gain the best results. How are you expanding how people perceive your brand through storytelling? What role the consumers or com companies have in helping to shape and influence that story? Do you let them get involved? Where will you tell your stories? 
in the future and how we use the channels available to you to broaden that story. That's really important, right? Because we want to build our universe so that our fans, our consumers, our clients, our stakeholders get to experience the brand where they want to experience it and where it's consistent with our brand promise, with our brand um, essence. And so knowing that and then engaging them there is really important. How will new partners enhance or change your storytelling? So when you think about getting together with someone else, it may be to help you get your product into a new category, but also you have their skill set and their, um, their resources to enhance the, the way the story is told. And that is a huge thing that lots of times does not get taken into consideration. How would their story blend with yours? If that's, that partner is getting to tell their story or their presence is so important, you cannot ignore their story. And so hopefully those are gonna be complementary. And I'm talking to somebody right now about how uh, his company and mine will merge around helping clients who have a need for both. And we have to think about how each of our stories will meld together. And if you want a bigger example, Coca-Cola with the Olympic Games. They've been together since 1928, so 92 years. They're almost at the 100 year mark. And their stories do blend together really nicely. How have you connected your story to selling your product? Well, your story really is the essence of how you communicate what your product is all about. So as we say in marketing, you know, telling your story is the marketing. Telling it to your target audience, telling it where they're at is the essence of it. But you need to have connected your story to selling your product to make it really align properly. How accurately can you measure how and when conversion occurs? This is important for all of us, right? We look at our social media stats, we look at our website stats, but there's also, um, in the words of Martin Lindstrom, uh, there's the small data, right? Those personal experiences we have that we know are important and we need to pay attention to. So let's review the key takeaways. Great marketers tell stories that people want to believe. Brands cannot simply go to market today with a narrative that's just about features, benefits, and price and be sustainable. We want way more than that. And that's why I talk about understanding your why, why you do what you do before you figure out what you do and how you do it. If you know why you do what you do and you communicate that, then you're going to connect with somebody at a deeper level and then they're going to con be concerned about the what and the how, or in other words, the features and the benefit and the price. Have something interesting to say. Use platforms available to make your brand heard. Ensure there is a central story underpinning what you talk about. Find ways to keep people interested beyond buying. And, and hopefully we, we're doing this at a, at a good level, but we're always talking about the value proposition. How is what we're communicating to you valuable? And then eventually, if it's valuable enough, then you will reach out to us and say, I need more of this. And that's, that's the way that we tend to approach and we involve our story in that process, where we were and where we are today. If you're going to build a connective story, then you need to provide people with multiple ways to connect with that story and provide them with control over the aspects of the narrative that affect them, right? You want to affect them, so give them some control over those aspects. Okay, continuing. Use short stories to bring people to, make, to the brand. Make that story part of a bigger story that brings people to you looking for answers. Tie the strands together. Um, there are lots of great examples of this. Um, Ford with, uh, with American Idol a number of years back used their advertising campaign to bring the characters, the, the contestants, the participants into their, into their advertisement. So, let's say that they had um, the top 12 that were still competing, they would create advertisements that played during the show that brought those characters into it. And so they brought the story of the American Idol program and competition in and connected to their brand, which is a really neat short story way of connecting the consumer to the brand. Bring in partners that add to the story and help form the wider eco ecosystem. We talked about that with Coca-Cola and the Olympics, but there's lots of other partnerships they brought uh, and they do bring. So the, the um, for example, NASCAR is a big one and FIFA football World Cup is another one. Know your own backstory. Stay true to what you were 
and connect that with the story of who you are today. Connect pieces, bridge gaps, explain mysteries. That's how you build true mythology. For Brand Alive, we used to be licensing Brands Inc. We were about helping companies license their brands. But over time, we realized that we had a lot more to contribute. We had brand building to, to add. We had brand expansion and extension to add. We had a lasso model to add. And so our story evolved from licensing brands, which was a good place to start to brand alive today, which is helping brands come alive in the hearts of those that experience them for our clients. Think long-term rather than campaign to campaign. Think anecdotally. Tell stories people relate to, not just those that make you feel comfortable. Link your world with theirs through story. If you can weave a story along the way, people are going to engage because that's the way we like to learn. All right, I want to give you a little bit about a company called, a story about a company called Sunbelt. This is a really cool company. Sunbelt uh, started out as a bottling company for the Coca Cola system. They were around probably in the 50s and the 60s and 70s, actually filling bottles with Coca Cola and selling those bottles. And it was around the 70s or the 80s, they decided they were going to get out of the bottling business and become a licensee for the Coca-Cola company, creating all kinds of memorabilia that centered on the bottle itself. So they created um, a crystal bottle. So they took the Coca-Cola bottle shape and created a crystal version of it. So it was really heavy, beautiful glass. Um, they, they wrapped the bottle in uh, gold um, uh, coloring or, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, filming. Uh, they did it also in silver and they did other products as well. And that's the way they connected initially. That's their backstory with Coca-Cola. And then they got into a whole lot of other products. But what they said was when they realized the real value of their brand and, the, and their story was after they had renewed the licensing agreement with Coca-Cola for probably now the seventh or eighth time. They'd been a licensee of the Coca-Cola company for probably 30 years. And that's where they became really profitable because Coca-Cola and Sunbelt knew they were one team and they knew what each other was going to do and they knew how to rely on each other. So that got rid of a lot of the, uh, the friction, let's say, and, and allowed for lots of profitability. Their overriding value was the continuity. In fact, I worked with Sunbelt when I worked on the Nagano Olympics, the, the Salt Lake Olympics, the Vancouver Olympics and the Sochi Olympics. Their products were brought into our program. And what we did was we took the Olympic marks and put it on the face of those Coca-Cola bottles in silver plate, gold plate, and in crystal. And when that happens, minimum guarantees, that's the money that licensees have to commit to a licensor. They've no longer become, become, become a concern because they know they have an existing program that's loved by consumers. And that number is really non-consequential. The key is to be patient as a licensee. And many times licensees, these are companies that are taking the brand and putting it into their products. They wanna see immediate results. And a lot of times that's just not gonna happen. But when you partner with a great brand and, and each of us are trying to build our brand into greatness, that's when the real magic happens. And as, as, a, as a, you know, they said, be always willing to walk away from a deal. If something doesn't look right, it doesn't feel right, then just step away. And finally, no licensor wants a licensee to fail, but they have their objectives that put a licensee in a bad situation. So both parties need to look at, you know, whenever, this is the future for many of us, but when we look at our brands and we look at potential partnerships, we, we need to always be thinking, how does this win for the other party? And if we're not considering that, then likelihood is it's probably not going to succeed because we don't have the other party's interests in mind just as much as we have our own. And when we do that, we create this really enduring marriage. All right, so now we're at the storied score chart. Let me go through it. Number one, we don't have a continuous story. It's campaign or product focused. The stories we do tell make our products more accessible, but we have not extended beyond that yet. Number two, we're starting to extend our story through content marketing into various channels. We're engaging with our customers to help us do that. Number three, we have a sense of our wider story and we are working with partners to connect everything we have 
in ways that will make sense for our customers. We'd like to involve them more further down the line. Number four, we have a purpose that drives us as a company. Our portfolio of brands reports to that ambition, but right now they do that as separate brands. Each brand has a fiercely strong tribe of customers. Number five, our brand is multi-layer, multi-channel, multi-partner universe held together by principles that make it consistent and that enable us to work together to build out what we stand for and to shuttle stories back and forth across a range of timeframes. Everything we do takes place within this context. Looking at Coca-Cola, they check the box on one, two, three, four, and truth is there are five. They are all of those things. Looking at Brand Alive, well, we're, we're, we're in the middle, we're number three. We have a sense of our wider story and we are working with partners to connect everything we have in ways that will make sense for our customers. We'd like to involve them more further down the line and we certainly have that in mind. So let's think about your own score and I'll let Ella put up the score chart or the poll I should say. All right, somebody's got a number four and a three and a two. Excellent, excellent. So we have two, three, and four. So nobody's, nobody's at one. And like I said before, if you were at one, that would be perfectly fine. And no one's at a five. And that's pretty understandable given uh, who's on the call today. But, but congratulations. I think you guys are doing great. All right, let's keep going. Scalable. Be clear on the following to get best results. What is, the sorry, what is the desired worth of your brand? It frames the level of investment required, right? If we know where we want to go with our brand, then we know how much investment to put towards that. Otherwise, it's just a, a pipe dream. Moreover, what are the assets you need to own? So if we wanna scale our business, we need to think about what resources, what assets we need in order to do that. Some of them we're gonna own, and some of them we're gonna use through partnerships. What intellectual property and protection will you build into your products? This is really important. As I think about our business, um, copyright and trademark are really important. How do consumers see you as a brand that owns ideas or one that occupies a specific sector? And that's important, right? Are we about ideas or are we about just some narrow focused product line? And, and clearly the former is more compelling than the latter. What do they value? These are consumers. What do they value you for and how elastic is that attribute? In other words, does it go away when a little, there's a little disruption or do they hang with you through kind of a more uh, difficult time? Continuing, what does scale mean for your overall brand presence and value? It might be fine for you just to stay where you're at and doing your thing in a very small world there's no, there's no judgment there. Or you might have scalability because you're, um, uh, let's say, a knowledge business and you can really support anyone anywhere in the world. Where will you take your brand? How many countries? How many territories in those countries? Why those ones in particular? We're looking at our own brand, Brand Alive, and we're seeing where are the people that seem to take the most interest? What countries are they located in? What cities are they located in? And then we're going to reach out to them so that they can hear us. And there's many places where we're not even considered, and that's just fine. We want, to, we want to connect to people that want and see value in what we're offering. What is the time horizon? Are your objectives smart? That means are they specific? Are they measurable? Are they achievable? Are they relevant? And are they time bound? In other words, if you put a time frame on them, can you accomplish them within that time frame? From where will the resources to achieve this growth come? How will you win? And that's what I love about brand licensing, right? It says, you don't have to be all things to all people. Even the biggest brands like Procter & Gamble, they license their brand to many companies because they know they can't do everything themselves, even as big as they are. How much will you do yourself and how much will you rely on others to do? And this is important. If you know there's certain things that you need to do and you're not ready for them, 
you just have to wait. Because if you bring somebody else to do them, that may not actually allow you to execute things the way they need to be executed. So don't be in a rush. Let's talk about the key takeaways. Consistent reach is rapidly becoming a historic metric. An historic metric. There will be a shift, not just in how brands scale, but also what they look for from scaling. There needs to be a benefit of scaling. The next era of globalization will need to reconcile not just new markets, but also local and individual relevance. This is becoming more and more important all the time. People expect their products to be customized, but they expect to pay for them as if they were sold around the world. And with 3D printing, that is becoming a reality more and more. Expect the world to increase, increasingly give way to my world in terms of where brands need to deliver. And that's really what we were just talking about. We will still have and need huge brands, but the criteria every marketer should be striving for is critical mass, i.e. that is access to the right markets at the right level of intensity to achieve their business goals. Critical mass is what matters to us. We don't have to be big brands. We just need to be in the right markets at the right level of intensity to achieve our business goals. Brands will scale in different ways. Some will use leverage. Some will change targets. Some will expand what consumers can expect. Some will find new ways and new places to make themselves heard. It's important to always be asking these questions and answering them. Scalability is not just about growth. Some will choose to expand their profitability by scaling back. There will be more hybridization as brands explore how they will grow. Great, get ready for more monstrous upstarts and more upstart monsters. And I'm seeing a lot more of the monstrous upstarts, but every once in a while you'll see these monsters who are being very um, nimble and that then they need to be, otherwise they're going to be um, forgotten. An example of an upstart monster is the Kodak company that recently announced that they are through some new um, technology they're going to be effectively changing their whole model. And I think when they announced that, their market share uh, grew by like 200%. Scale is nothing without a catalyst to drive and maintain it. The biggest challenge brands face as they look to scale is their ability to stay, stay true to what they are. We all need a catalyst. We need to be thinking about what that catalyst is that can help us achieve our goals, our business goals, and achieve critical mass. And, and, and they're out there. Those catalysts are out there and they're looking for us and we may be a catalyst for them. Let me talk about the Busted Knuckle Garage. I love this brand. It's such a fun brand. Uh, the, the, the originator of the Busted Knuckle Garage is a gentleman named Warren Tracy. I met Warren Tracy when I was writing the book Expand, Grow, Thrive. And he told me his story and I interviewed him for the book and I love the story and he's helped He's thankful that he's in the book and I'm thankful that he is also. So Warren Tracy was at school at Arizona State University back in 1988. And when he was there, he heard about the story of the Cherokee uh, brand. The Cherokee brand was about apparel. And what he realized was that this was a fascinating business that they were in where they used a lot of licensees to grow their business. And so while he was there, he started contemplating what could he do when he got out of school to create his own brand that others could benefit. So he founded a company in 2000 called the Busted Knuckle Garage, and he grew the brand by expanding the products that could appeal to guys that love cars, they love garages, and they love things that were just greasy. Uh, so he started out um, in things like lip balm and in uh, uh, gloves you know, for the, for the uh, garage. And now he's considering things like car washes and restaurants because his brand has an emotional connection. So what did he do? He started licensing his brand to partner companies that needed a brand. They had these great products that were, that were connected to the same target as the Busted Knuckle Garage, but they had no emotional connection. And what the Busted Knuckle Garage brand did was give that, them, them that emotional connection. And as a result of that, he's been in business for the last 20 years with this brand. And now he's able to help not only his own brand grow into these categories, but he's able to help these companies that have these products that fit with his brand to also grow and to be more meaningful and have a better um, uh, purpose uh, in addition to building the revenue of uh, each of their companies. 
So it's a fun story about a small brand that is definitely what I call an overcomer. So we're now at the scalability score chart. I'll review this and then we can score our brands. Number one, we have a very small number of brands that are growing strongly. We generate intense profit out of keeping things condensed. We're looking for constant and controlled growth. Number two, our brand portfolio achieves growth by expanding to meet, to meet changing market demand. We're looking to keep pace with the prevailing rates of change. Number three, we, we dynamically manage our brand portfolio across a growing number of countries. We buy, sell, create, and discontinue brands to achieve our revenue goals. We judge our success by how much each brand in our portfolio exceeds metrics. Number four, we look for opportunities to grow our presence through arrangements with others, such as licensing, joint ventures, and project partnerships. We're looking for agreed rates of return from these initiatives. Number five, our brand portfolio is global and spread across multi-sectors via many different arrangements. We use this diversified approach to make the most of rapidly growing markets and to counter downward movements in others. So again, scoring Coca-Cola and it gets a little bit boring, but they've checked the box on number one, number two, number three, number four. And truth be told, they are a global company with a variety of brands and they are doing those exact things that number five um, articulates. Now, what about Brand Alive? Where are we? Well, on the scalable chart, we're really at number two. Our brand portfolio achieves growth by expanding to meet changing market demand. We, we're looking to keep pace with the prevailing rates of change. And, and we wanna to get to number three and we're probably close to that. Uh, we, we, we have the opportunity to get close to that maybe in 2021 or 2022, but right for today, we're at number two. How about you guys? Where do you score, Ella? Okay, I see some number twos and number fours. Who else? More number twos. Um, we're all in this camp <laughs> together. Alrighty. So the dominant uh, category is number two. Uh, and, and it's not surprising because we're talking about scalability and we're, this mostly um, is reflective of larger companies, but it doesn't mean that we can't get there. And, and to the one that is at, at a number four today, congratulations on that scalability, that's, that's impressive. All right, let's continue to the last element of the lasso scored, scored card. What structure is needed to deliver your idea to its full potential? How much of that structure do you need to make it a reality? Just how important is your intellectual property to you? How have you valued your IP? Where are you vulnerable to leaving money on the table? What do you need to own to succeed? What do you expect to own in the next five years or 10 years? And why is that important? Let's be clear on the following to gain the best results. What do you expect to lose or share? What do you expect copied or to become industry standard? I mentioned that I'm in a partnership, uh, you know, I'm collaborating with my brother on this product that he invented. He knows that there may be the possibility of patenting his invention, but we also know that it very well could be copied uh, and we may not get the patent. So if it does get copied, what are we gonna do about it? And even if it is patented, there may be plenty of people copying it, but we're not in a position to actually keep them from doing that and do we care or how much do we care is probably a better way of saying it. will your ownership model change over the next five years it could go from one where you're actually manufacturing everything and owning everything to a licensing business where you're outsourcing everything think of the nokia brand it's a big global brand that was founded in finland right I'll make sure i got that right um, scandinavia <laughs> um, that brand used to be a manufacturing company. Today, it only exists in a, in a licensing capacity. How will your model impact what's ownable, what isn't, and what could be? What are the revenue streams? Where are the revenue streams going? 
and for what will you be compensated and for what else will customers be willing to pay going forward? What is more important to your sector, speed to market or ownership of market? Let's go through the key takeaways. Ownable is multi-dimensioned. It's about structure and properties, but it's also about a sense of belonging. More brands should sync how they are formed and what they own with the relationship they are looking to build. This is really important. As assumptions about how business is organized change, what companies own and feel they need to own will also change. That has implications for how to assess brand wealth and how to judge brand value. Valuation models need to be linked to brand equity. It will be exciting when it's possible to monitor the changing value of a brand as we monitor movements in its stock. Wouldn't that be cool to be able to go onto some chart somewhere and go, oh, the brand value of Brand Alive is worth X thousands of dollars today. And is it going up or is it going down? And I think someday we're gonna to get to that. From a brand perspective, in mergers and acquisition, both parties must contemplate and grapple with how they were merged and then strengthen their brand architecture to take advantage of what they control. Otherwise, there's just too much at risk. Continuing, brand protection, brand valuation, and brand strategy need to stop acting as separate disciplines and work together to align what makes a brand owned and ownable. There, I know there's a few of us that have worked at large corporations, and we know that these groups are siloed, but truth be told, they need to come together and think as one unit. Keeping track of remuneration requires tracking where you are most vulnerable to leaving money on the table. Protect what you can't afford to protect. I mean, as I mentioned with the example with my brother, we're going to do that, we know it's important, but we also know we can be successful even if it's copied. And I think about these things myself when I talk about, um, you know, amongst our team, what we're going to give away and what we're going to ask to be, to, for people to pay for. If you can't afford to protect something outright, you may want to rethink how you bring it to market. That's, that's, the, that's the hard work, right? That's us thinking about innovatively how we bring something to market so that everybody benefits. To maximize own ability, start with what you have and structure what you offer to best meet demand in your sector. All right, let's talk about one more case study. This is on Graco. Graco is an American brand. Uh, it's owned actually by Newell Brands and it is in the uh, baby business. They make car seats and um, pack and plays and um, strollers. And what they realized was that the brand, if they wanted it to be more encompassing in the lives of mothers and fathers, they needed to get in the minds of those mothers and fathers and realize what was important to them. And so they did this research and what they realized is that uh, for moms and dads, when, um, when, they're, when they become pregnant, they start thinking then at the moment of pregnancy about how to build out the nursery. And so they realized that it was important for them if they wanted to extend their presence in a family during the early childhood of, the, of, of their offspring, that they needed to think about extending the brand into an, a, a way that could allow them to get into the mindset of the, of the mother and father about building out the nursery. And so they thought, okay, we don't have the capability to create these products ourselves, but the brand is strong enough that we can expand into these categories through licensing. And so they went into licensing with products such as um, cribs and bedding and um, everything that was associated with that experience of building out the nursery, whether it was a changing table or some of the, um, uh, the toys like a mobile above the baby's uh, crib, these things were all part of it. And so by bringing in partners that were just as good at what they did as Graco was at, at making strollers and making car seats and pack and plays, they could build the brand universe for the consumer, for the mom and dad, and touch them at the most sensitive time when they had just learned that they were expecting. And so they could grow and build uh, this wonderful um, ecosystem with the mom and dad that they could trust the Graco brand with their child in the most vulnerable places. And so then they were able to move from 
children in car seats at maybe an infant stage to now actually buying products before the baby was born. So really successful program for Graco because of their contemplation and the research they did and then the action of licensing their brand. All right, now we're at the ownable score chart. This is the last score chart. I'll review it and then let's score our brands. Number one, we only act within what we know and for what we're known. We're fiercely protective of our IP. We have full ownership of everything we do. Number two, we continue to add new products and, our, and IP to our brand through merger and acquisition. Number three, we are open to a limited number of partnerships, joint ventures, and other arrangements that extend our perceived ownership in the marketplace. Number four, we share ownership with other brands, other major brands in the marketplace through co-branded projects. We use these projects to redefine how our customers perceive us. And number five, we cultivate an open model where individuals and groups can work with our properties to take them to new and exciting places. Only minimal guidelines are in place. Okay, if I look at the Coca-Cola company, we actually did not land on a five this time. I, I believe they are at the level of four, which is they share ownership with other major brands in the marketplace through co-branded projects. They use projects to redefine how their customers perceive them. But they're a company that's very selective about their IP. Remember, Coca-Cola has the world's greatest known trade secret. That is the secret formula of the Coca-Cola product. So they, they are always been a little bit close to the vest with their IP. Now, Brand Alive, where are we? We're actually a little bit further down. I believe we're number three. We are open to a limited number of partnerships, joint ventures, and other arrangements that extend our perceived ownership in the marketplace. And, and hopefully if you've gotten to know us over time, you see that we're willing to um, be more open with our, with our, uh, our knowledge because we, we see that as a part of our mission. All right, Ella, let's get to the poll and let's see where everyone nets out on their scoring on Ownable. Everybody so far is a number three. Who else? All right, we're all in the number three category. Well, maybe that says something about the group of people on this call today, but that's exciting. So now we're at the point where we're ready to, um, to take our numbers and move to a position of actually scoring the brand with the, with the um, algorithm. So let's go ahead and close out and keep going. All right, you guys ready? To obtain your score, so I'm gonna take a couple of minutes and then you can chime in to let us know whether or not you have any problem. But basically you wanna to go to pcanalikio.com forward slash lasso. There you'll import your, input your scores for each lasso category. And if you have your sector listed, go ahead and uh, put that in. Some of the sectors include character, collegiate, corporate brands, entertainment, fashion, and sport. But if yours isn't listed, don't worry about it. Just leave it blank. And while it might be slightly less accurate, the model will still provide a very reasonable determination. And as I mentioned earlier, as we build the database, we will add industry sectors to enhance the model's accuracy. So I ask you, what can you do today to make your brand come alive in the hearts of those who experience it?